Welcome to a new episode of Cheaters Always Cheat. Like, subscribe, and share to stay connected. My ex, whom we'll call D, and I were high school sweethearts, even though we attended different high schools. We actually met while working at a restaurant and we hit it off right away. It was amazing, we couldn't get enough of each other, and I truly believed it was real love. Both our families adored each other. Dee's cousin Shannon also became one of my closest friends, and we would hang out together all the time. We were like the three Thea Musketeers. By the time we graduated, we had been together for nearly two years. I had plans to join the army while she was going to attend a local college. We were devastated and heartbroken. I even thought about proposing to her before leaving for the army. We talked about it, and she said she would say yes, but in the end, we agreed to wait a bit longer. So with a broken heart, but a strong belief that we were meant to be together forever, I went off to basic training. During basic, I could only call her three times, but we wrote letters to each other almost every day. It was rare for me to not receive a letter from her during mail call. She came down with my parents to attend my basic training graduation, and seeing her was amazing. It only reinforced my belief that we were destined to be together forever. Once my training in the Army was completed, I was stationed at Fort Hood, Texas, serving in the 1st Cavalry Division. First team. I ended up spending most of my paychecks on phone calls to D and saving up for plane tickets either for my visits home or for her to come see me. I would make it back home about every six months, and she visited me twice in two years. Every time I returned home, it felt like a joyous celebration of our love. After being in the army for two years, I felt ready to propose to her. I went and got a cheap engagement ring and started making plans for my next trip back home. However, that's when I received a letter from Dee's cousin, Shannon. Shannon informed me that Dee had been cheating on me. It hit me hard. I called Shannon to get more details and she revealed that Dee had been secretly involved with another guy. When Shannon confronted Dee about it, Dee brushed it off as just fooling around and assured her that I was still her future husband. I asked Shannon who this guy was that Dee had been fooling around with. At first, Shannon was hesitant to tell me because she didn't want to create more problems, but her reluctance made me suspect that it was someone I knew, so I convinced her to disclose the truth. It turned out to be one of my closest friends, whom I had known since junior high and we had been buddies ever since. Let's call him M. I asked Shannon not to inform Dee that I knew about the affair, as I had initially planned to surprise her with a visit and a marriage proposal, but now my intention had shifted to confronting her about her betrayal. So, about a week later, I decided to go back home and confront both Dee and M. First, I went to Dee's house, but she wasn't there. Then, I headed over to M's rundown apartment, and guess whose car was parked outside? Dee's. I knocked on the door, and M's roommate who happened to be someone I knew, not really a friend though, answered. He was completely flustered and couldn't speak properly. I asked if I could come in and talk to my good friend M. He tried to come up with some awkward excuse, but when I mentioned that I saw M's car outside, he reluctantly let me in. As soon as I stepped inside, I could hear M and D going at it in his bedroom. She was always loud and that's one of the things I liked about her. He shouted down the hall to let M know he had company. Then he sat down on the couch eagerly watching the drama unfold. It took about five more agonizing minutes for M and D to finally emerge from the bedroom. My heart shattered when I saw her walking out of that room wearing a smile on her face. But that smile quickly faded as soon as she laid eyes on me standing there in the dining room. I just stood there, silently staring at her for a moment. She started to make some excuse, but I didn't say a word. I simply turned around and walked out. I was utterly devastated. It felt like my world had come crashing down. I spiraled into a deep depression. I went back to Fort Hood and just went through the motions, operating on autopilot. During the initial weeks, I received numerous letters from Dee, begging for forgiveness and asking me to call her so she could explain herself. But I chose not to respond. I loved Dee so much that if I had seen her or spoken to her, I would have ended up forgiving her. However, I couldn't spend my life with someone I could never trust. I did make a few calls to Shannon, though. She mentioned that Dee was upset and angry that I wouldn't give her a second chance. Maybe if it hadn't been one of my closest friends, I could have considered it. But the sense of betrayal I experienced was too overwhelming, and I knew I could never trust her again. 
life moved forward and I lost touch with Shannon and all my old friends from before my time in the army. I met another woman and eventually got married. We had a son together. Nearly 20 years had gone by since my heart was shattered. One day, while attending one of my son's peewee football practices, I ran into Shannon. It turned out her son was on the same team as mine. After some small talk, she revealed that she and M had continued seeing each other after D and I broke up. About a year after our breakup, D became pregnant, but as soon as M found out, he disappeared. D was left as a single mother with many regrets. She hasn't been able to sustain a relationship for longer than three months since then. Shannon informed me that D still considers me the love of her life and believes no other guy compares to me. According to Shannon, D wishes she could turn back time and prevent herself from messing up the best thing she ever had. Her words, not mine. Shannon suggested arranging a lunch between D and me to help her move on, but I told her not to even mention to D that she had seen me. The thought of seeing D would still cause too much pain. Even to this day, I struggle with trust issues and find it hard to develop close friendships with other men. I keep a guard up to protect myself from potential hurt, which sometimes prevents me from fully opening up to my wife. Please understand I love my wife dearly and I would never do anything to jeopardize our marriage. However, I still have lingering feelings that Dee was the love of my life, and if she were to re-enter my life today, it would be extremely difficult for me not to fall for her again. Second story? Well, about four years ago, I was in a relationship with a girl who seemed absolutely perfect for me in every way. We shared the same dark sense of humor and had similar interests in activities and music. We could spend endless hours just chatting about anything and everything. She was the kind of person I wanted to leave everything behind for and embark on adventures together, exploring the highest mountains and the deepest valleys. One thing that made us click was our mutual agreement on not wanting children. Whenever we went out to eat and saw a bunch of kids, we'd opt to get our food to go. Her parents and friends adored me, which was nice since I had just moved to town before we started dating. She even told me I was the most patient and understanding boyfriend she had ever had. Although we attended different colleges in separate states, we managed to make it work. She even came to my school for a week before her classes began, and once she left, we stayed in touch through Skype and text messages all day long. However, things started to change a little bit. She became less talkative and seemed less enthusiastic when we spoke. So, during a short break I had from school, I decided to visit her. We spent three days together, worked through any issues, and everything seemed perfectly fine again. A couple of months later, things started repeating themselves. She would talk to me less and always seemed busy partying with her friends, some of whom lived just a few houses down from my parents' place. I didn't think too much of it at first, assuming that she just needed me to be physically present more often and that the distance between us was taking its toll. So, I came up with a plan to surprise her. The problem was, as a broke college student without a job or a car, I couldn't simply drive up to see her. I didn't have enough money for a plane or bus ticket either. However, I packed my backpack with essential supplies and a duffel bag with about four days' worth of clothes. Then, I headed over to the truck stop near the interstate and asked a few truckers which direction they were headed. It took me around 15 hours to reach her, a distance of 500 miles which would normally take 10 hours by car, which wasn't too bad, all things considered. I had to switch semi-trucks four times during the journey, and when I arrived in the town, where my parents lived, about 400 miles away from my college, with her college being 100 miles further, I borrowed my brother's pickup truck. I arrived pretty late, and when I got there, her roommates, whom I knew from my previous visit, informed me that she wasn't around, but that I could sleep in her room while waiting for her. So, that's what I did. The next morning, when I woke up, she still hadn't appeared, so I decided to send her a text. I simply said, Hey, what's up? She responded, Not much, just hanging out with my friend Zane. Hmm. At that point, I started feeling a bit suspicious, but I didn't let it bother me too much. I asked her roommates where Zane lived, and they gave me the details of his dorm. So I made my way there, leaving my clothes in her room, but taking my backpack with me. I reached the third floor, where Zane resided, and began scanning the doors for his name. Finally, at the end of the hallway, I spotted the name Zane. 
I knocked on the door, but there was no response. I tried again, but still no answer. I figured they were probably hanging out somewhere else on campus, so I turned back and started walking toward the stairs. As I reached the top step of the stairs, I paused and took out my pack of cigarettes, planning to smoke as I made my way back across campus. And then it happened. That dreadful sound that nobody ever wants to hear. It was a heart-wrenching, soul-crushing sound that drained all the color from the world. My mind started racing. My heart pounded and my muscles tensed up. I swiftly turned around and opened the nearby window, sticking my head out for some fresh air. I stood there for about 30 seconds just looking at the sun. It was a bright day despite the cold late fall weather. Then I glanced back at the door behind me, and there it was, clear as day. His name, Zane. I must have overlooked it initially. With determination, I knocked on the door, loudly and forcefully, but I wasn't quite sure what to say, so the first words that came out were, Hey, come out here. The sounds inside ceased. Room service? The guy on the other side responded. I chuckled to myself for some reason. I knocked again, this time more insistently, and declared, I know you're in there. He said, Girl Scout cookies, leave them by the door. That's when it hit me. She had no idea it was me knocking on the door. I had been growing more and more anxious, and I realized I was still holding a cigarette in my hand. I stepped outside, propping the door open with my backpack. I sent her another text. Hey, it's me. D. She replied pretty quickly, asking, What? Why don't you come outside so we can talk? I suggested. I'm having another cigarette. Please come outside. She didn't come out even after I finished the second one, so I went back upstairs. This time I lightly knocked on the door without saying anything. The weight of the situation was hitting me hard, and every muscle in my body felt exhausted. After a couple of seconds, she opened the door and I saw the guy quickly dart into the closet in the background. She gave a small, defeated smile that seemed to say, Hey. She tried to speak, but nothing came out. She walked out, looking like a puppy with its tail between its legs. She was on the verge of tears. I placed my hands on her shoulders. I'm so upset right now. It's taking every ounce of my being to hold back from yelling. Can we go outside and talk? I need another cigarette. In the quietest voice imaginable, she replied, Okay. Everything was falling apart in my life. I tried my best to stay strong, but it was really hard. We spent around two hours sitting outside just talking. Oh, the night before, she had started sleeping with him. They had met a week earlier when she went to the pet store where he worked. That was the breaking point for us. After our conversation outside, we ended up fighting for about 12 hours in her dorm room. Then the fighting continued through text messages for two whole months. I saw her one more time when I visited my parents and it went really, really bad. But that's a different story. In the end, the guy she cheated on me with got her pregnant and both of them dropped out of school. She was a freshman and he was a senior with only one semester left. Neither of them went back to school. She moved to a city four hours away from where our parents lived to live with his parents. Like I mentioned, that was four years ago, so their child is almost three now. She's feeling depressed, doesn't have many friends, and is technically separated from the guy. But they're still in a relationship. They don't trust each other, so they decided to live in separate places even though they're still dating. I can sense that she probably regrets having a child since she never wanted kids in the first place. Third story. So, here's the deal. I recently found out that my wife has been cheating on me for the past seven months. It all started with an emotional affair and then escalated from there. We've been together for 23 years and have eight kids. For about five months leading up to this revelation, she had me convinced that I was the one causing problems in our relationship. I couldn't understand why she kept bringing up old issues and why nothing I did seemed to make her happy. Well, guess who the other guy is? It's actually her high school ex-boyfriend who is currently married and has four kids of his own. The crazy part is that he lives in another state, but just a few miles away from where they both went to high school. About seven months ago, my wife reached out to him and then conveniently went to visit her parents in September and October. While she did visit them, she finally admitted to seeing him during those trips, but she refuses to admit if they had closeness. She plays these word games when I try to get a straight answer. But here's the kicker. I know for sure that they had phone closeness and they even did it in our own home. The day I found out about all of this was 19 days ago. 
At 3 a.m., I started typing up a message to confront my wife, but then I thought to myself that decisions made in the middle of the night aren't usually the best ones, so I ended up deleting it. But oops, I accidentally sent her a blank message. The next day, she tried calling me back, but I was at work and didn't see it. My wife was livid. Apparently, I'm the villain in this situation. When I asked if the other guy's wife knew about their affair, my wife told me that he's handling it. Well, a week later, the other guy's wife posts this grateful post on Facebook, thanking her husband for teaching her about unconditional love and all that jazz. And here we are. 19 days later, they spend hours talking on the phone every day while I'm working hard. All right, let's break it down. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of reaching out to the other guy's wife? On one hand, if I were in her shoes and unaware of what's going on, I would definitely want to know the truth. On the other hand, and maybe this is foolish of me, I still have a tiny bit of hope for reconciliation and contacting the wife probably won't help with that. Today, I had my first meeting with a lawyer, and surprisingly, he actually suggested reaching out to the other guy's wife. Mm, however, the few family members and close friends I've confided in are pretty much against the idea. I shouldn't be shocked. I know that my wife is a complete narcissist who believes her own lies. But I still couldn't believe it when she spent half the day locked in a room, texting, calling her affair partner. I saw all the texts. She's not as sneaky as she thinks she is, instead of being with our kids, and the nerve she has to tell me that the kids are her top priority. I'll never understand how she could throw away our 23 years together and our eight children. I'm not going to waste my energy trying to make sense of it. It's just irrational. She's a narcissist who admitted that what she's doing is wrong, yet she continues to do it. That's bordering on sociopathic behavior. I even asked her if she would forgive me if I had done what she did, and she flat out said no. Here she is, still carrying on with the affair. The only thing she's afraid of is me exposing her affair to people, and I don't know how long that fear will last. My lawyer has advised me not to contact the other guy's wife until we have some legal protections in place, and I'm anxiously waiting for that. Her complete disrespect towards me and our children makes me sick, and my kids have no idea what's really going on. All right, let's break it down. So... What are the good and bad things about reaching out to the other guy's wife? On one hand, if I were in her situation and unaware of the truth, I would definitely want to know what's going on. On the other hand, and maybe this is a bit naive of me, I still have a tiny glimmer of hope for us to reconcile, and contacting the other woman is unlikely to help with that. Today I had my first meeting with a lawyer, and surprisingly, he actually suggested reaching out to the other guy's wife. However, the few family members and close friends I've talked to are pretty much against the idea. I shouldn't be surprised. I know my wife is a complete narcissist who believes her own lies. But I was still shocked when I discovered that she spent half the day locked in a room texting calling her affair partner. I saw all the messages. She's not as sneaky as she thinks. She did this instead of being with our kids, and it really hurt me. And to add insult to injury, she has the audacity to claim that the kids are her top priority. I'll never be able to comprehend how she could throw away our 23 years together and our eight children. I won't waste my energy trying to understand it anymore. It just doesn't make sense. She's a narcissist who admitted that what she's doing is wrong, yet she continues to do it. That's almost sociopathic behavior. I even asked her if she would forgive me if I had done what she did and she flat out said, no. But here she is, still carrying on with the affair. The only thing she's afraid of is me exposing her affair to people, and I don't know how long that fear will last. My lawyer has advised me not to contact the other guy's wife until we have some legal protection in place, and I'm anxiously waiting for that. It's sickening how she completely disrespects me and our children, and my kids have no clue about what's really happening. I just want to shield my kids from the pain, but I can't and it's the worst thing I've ever experienced. In some ways, it's becoming easier to not feel intense anger, but after therapy sessions, I actually feel worse because it brings out those emotions again. Here's an update. A month after she asked for a divorce, she officially responded to the divorce petition, expressing her intention to take my children and move out of state to live with her parents. Coincidentally, 
her parents lived just five minutes away from her affair partner. Three months later, her lawyer and the mediator finally made her understand that she wouldn't win a case to relocate, especially when our teenage kids made it clear they didn't want to go. So she changed her mind and decided she wanted to keep the marital home. She even told the mediator that our neighborhood community would want her to stay there. But then she received some direct feedback from people in our neighborhood community who said that if their spouses had done what she did, cheating, the cheaters would be sleeping in a tent on the front lawn. Suddenly, she backed down from fighting for the marital home. To clarify, I have mixed feelings about keeping it. I could use a fresh start after her infidelity, but my older kids ask me to stay in the home with their younger siblings. She hasn't spoken to me in over three months, even though we're still living under the same roof, so I have no idea what her plans are now. In my best-case scenario, she would move back in with her affair partner, assuming he actually leaves his wife and four kids, and leave the kids with me for the school year. It would be tough to be away from the kids for most of the summer, but at least I wouldn't have to deal with the devil multiple times every week. Unfortunately, once she gave up on the relocation fight, she decided she's not moving, at least not right away. When I look back at when I first confronted her about the affair, I can't believe I tried to fight for reconciliation. I had no clue how deeply she was involved with someone else. She texted me yesterday saying she wanted to talk today. We haven't spoken in 3.5 months. I thought it would be about the kids, the house, or alimony, so I went into the conversation trying to remain emotionally neutral. She kind of tried to justify it. But she started off by saying something she had never said before. I'm sorry. Then she followed it up with nonsense like, I never meant to cause pain. Oh, having closeness with another man was an accident? But I was surprised that she actually used the S word. I don't believe her apology, and I told her that actions speak louder than words. I let her know that I didn't believe her, but I wonder if this means she's starting to snap out of her affair haze. She said she hopes we can start talking again, but I made it clear that I never wanted to stop talking in the first place. I reminded her that everything we're going through, her affair, the divorce, not talking, and so on, has been her choice. She mentioned that she's ready to have conversations without anger, conveniently forgetting that she's the one who cheated. I told her that, as far as I knew, she was still in a relationship with her affair partner, and she tried to brush it off, saying that her answer didn't matter. I emphasized that it matters a great deal to me. Overall, it was just a five-minute conversation, and it doesn't change anything. I can't help but wonder if reality might finally be breaking through her delusion, if you want more details, you can check my previous posts, but I've been going through a divorce with my cheating, lying, and home-wrecking soon-to-be ex-wife for about eight months. However, as far as I know, and this was confirmed a couple of months ago, her family is aware of the divorce, but not the cheating and home-wrecking. I'm sure she has painted me as the bad guy, but I can't control that, so I try not to worry about it. It does make me wonder why they think she was the one who moved out of the house, though. A few months ago, I wrote a letter to my in-laws to express my gratitude for being good grandparents to my children and for supporting our family over the years. In that letter, I also mentioned the affair. They know the person she cheated with, but I made it clear that I expect them to support their daughter and let them know they can contact me if they ever want to talk, although I don't really expect them to. My lawyer advised against sending the letter, and for almost eight months, I followed that advice but I'm getting tired of allowing her to control my actions. Recently, my lawyer suggested waiting so that her position doesn't become more aggressive, but ultimately the decision is up to me. I had my therapist read the letter, and he doesn't see any issue with me sending it. Among my friends and family, uh, there's an even split on whether I should send the letter or not. I talked to the school counselor about arranging a meeting for our younger children, ages 13, 11, 9, 7, to check on how they're coping with the divorce. As far as I know, only the 13-year-old is aware of my soon-to-be ex-wife's affair, and he found out from his older sister before I did. Since this requires my soon-to-be ex-wife's approval, I picked up the necessary forms for both of us. I informed her about it through email, that's our only means of communication, and her response was that I should have discussed it with her beforehand, and she will consider whether or not to allow the kids to see the counselor. 
To be honest, I'm not surprised by her reaction. It was pretty much what I expected. I replied that I don't need her permission to explore options for the kids, and I haven't taken any steps without her consent. I also made it clear that I hope she prioritizes the mental well-being of our children once she finishes considering it. She has acknowledged growing up in an environment with poor communication, so maybe seeing a counselor can help our children avoid going through similar issues.